Welcome to Bonehead Weekly. This Did you actually week, record yourself saying action? Well, I don't know that I intended to do it. Okay. That's, that's pretty self-serving. I mean, don't I'm cut it out. Self-serving. Don't cut it out. If you, you insist upon yourself, I and insist just, myself upon myself. And just in case you didn't, action. There you go. Now, <laughs> back to Bonehead Weekly. We are talking about anthology films, something I loved as a child, something as I loved as a young adult, and something yeah. I really don't get a lot of anymore, other than maybe some VHS films from here or there or something like that. Yeah, it's not a ton it's, of them. I don't, except for one that I'm going to talk about. Yeah, they've kind of gone away, <laughs> and I don't understand that. Um, and the other thing is, too, I got to talk about this to begin with. I just want to hit this home. I don't know what your guys. You're going to hit this, are you, Chad? Yeah. I don't know what you're going to hit. I don't know what you guys are going to talk about. And this may kind of jump into that. I started doing research because I had my list that I came up with. As, as, and if you haven't listened to the show, as I mentioned this before, I don't usually do research start, on, on my picks. Yeah, what, a, <laughs> what a terrible episode to begin on. Well, I mean, seriously. Go back I, and watch I, one of the mixed drawn ones, then come back to yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh his head's gonna get huge from that all right yeah i use my own personal movie knowledge and go okay these are the ones i really I'm doing like. that for the airlines joe that way he has to pay for two seats <laughs> see his head so big anyway but anyway. today this time i started look i decided to you know kind of just google anthology films because i felt because fyi the re, one of the main reasons I, I i googled is there was an anthology movie that i think i've made up in my head that i watched as a kid and I did tons of research and I could not find it. I couldn't even tell. I, and guys, I don't even, don't even ask me a plot. I can't, I could not think of it. I was trying to find a list of anthology films and see if anything would trigger my head, my brain. And I, I couldn't find it. But what I did find are movies that are listed as anthologies that I never thought of as anthology, but they actually are now that I've seen them on those lists. I have the, I, you beat me to it. I'm telling you, I was, there's a couple. I was like, damn, didn't realize that. But it is. You're right. Yeah. Like, for example, Pulp Fiction. Pulp Fiction. Is an anthology film. Love Actually. Yeah. Anthology. H History of the World Part One. Anthology. Exactly. I never Moon thought Moonwalker. Sorry, I just wanted to say one. No. No, you I just never wanted to say a movie. No, Moonwalker is an anthology. I don't know. I don't know if I've ever seen it. I've never seen it. I played the video game. Good for <laughs> you. <laughs> Uh, all I, I remember about the movie is Joe Pesci with weird hair and then the giant robot. That's all I remember about I don't the movie. Need your sympathy. Well, good. You're not getting it. So, Chad, keep going. No, I just never knew those were anthology films. I never, I never, because when I think of anthology, I think of horror. Yeah, and I, I, I don't know why, and I don't know if everybody else in the in the world who loves film has had that same association with anthology, and I don't know why. And apparently, Joe, it's the same with you too. When you think of anthology, you think of horror films. I really the did. I mean, you think of Creep Show. You think of uh, the Twilight Zone, the movie. Twilight Zone, the movie. I'm sorry, I've I've got a bunch of lists here. I was thinking of yeah. uh, one of the ones that popped up into my head, and I doubt that I'll talk about it today. Was uh, Tales from the Dark Side, the movie. <clears throat> Cat's Eye. Speaking of Stephen, we were talking about Stephen King. Oh man, you're oh, listing all the movies, but we probably should get into that later. <laughs> well, I I didn't list any that I thought you all would talk about. You but just listed only... two of my top ones. I did? Yeah. Fuck you. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, you'll get two of it a bit. I didn't say which ones. Yeah, yeah. You know, the, I, the only two that I thought that came out in the last few years were the... Uh, did either one of you watch the Mar Mortuary Collection? No. It's pretty good. It's a lot of fun. It's a little too long. It stars Clancy Brown. And... Um, well, I don't want to give the other one away because it's a Coen Brothers film and I'm afraid one of you used it. You. <laughs> so we'll talk about that in a second. Yeah, Chad, you have it first. You go. You ahead. have a you who? But you no, seriously, know. why do you think horror films have kind of capitalized on the anthology series? I don't understand. Well, you know, son. Go ahead. I, I was going to say, but, am I loud? <laughs> You're not. Uh, what? Is it bad? <laughs> no, anyway, oh, my um, God. Holy shit. Did he just tell me to land the plane? I'll have a um, double cheeseburger with a Diet Coke. <laughs> You'll get nothing and like it. Um, do you think that was the Jeff Foxworthy joke I was about to do, which is very sad? You want a hot apple pie? Um, <laughs> See, how funny. Nope. The uh, 
Do you think that was because horror sometimes uh, certain varieties of Did horror work? Horror or horror? Go ahead. So, well, let's see which one you think applies best. Do you think it works best because? it can be harder to maintain. Like sometimes short shocks are easier than having to establish and keep going. Cause I, I think about, if you think about classic horror stories, your, your Edgar Allan Poe. That's exactly where I was going, your, where I was going to go. They're, they're not, Poe doesn't write novels. Yep. They're short. He did. He, he wrote one, but still, I mean. Yeah. And I just didn't know if the fact that, you know, like there is an industry for short films here and, and, there are, but most of those short films are documentaries or drama pieces or comedies. And I didn't, and you know, horror has always had that stigma with it. Not as, not as much as lately, it's kind of become its own art form, even though it always has been an art form, but it's gotten more of a, you know, popular view of it. But now it's like, is it because of the fact that they couldn't contain themselves that they just said, okay, we're just going to put all, we're just going to put short films in a little, group and put them into one gigantic movie i don't know well they're all genre even whole yeah. fiction genre yeah i mean it's all genre and the one you're going to talk about with the cohen's that's genre they're yeah all genre so you don't have well yeah even even four weddings in a few well i shouldn't say four i don't know but yeah well, i don't I think four they're weddings all genre they're all genre. i don't i was gonna say i don't remember you four weddings and a funeral as an anthology film well i stopped myself Okay, sorry, I thought but, you. But but I was trying. But yeah, I, most of them are all genre. I think it goes back to literature. I think James is right. That's exactly what I was thinking. Is that the short story, and, and it probably goes back even further than that, gentlemen. It's probably that it's everybody sitting around the fire. What's out there? That's scary. I mean, the first story ever told was a horror story. It was a ghost story. It was something super something. What do you all think? Uh, yeah. I bet it was a fart joke. I don't think that. I don't. <laughs> probably not. No. The first story ever told around the campfire was probably that because we're all scared of the dark. Kind yeah. Of. And I'm assuming the first story ever told was some sort of horror story. And they're just, they're sweet little nuggets, right? They're just, just little bitty tastes. And we love them in short stories and we love them in anthologies. But we really don't get anthologies anymore. And on top of that, most anthologies are not overly successful films. I was wondering uh, the last really successful anthology that came to a theater and made a lot of money was probably Creep Show in 1982. Well, do you consider Pulp Fiction an anthology? Well, yeah, I guess. I, yeah, you're probably right, but I, I can't think of another. There's not. Yeah, a I mean, line. Love Actually and, and Pulp Fiction. Pulp Fiction. I just don't see a lot of anthology films. No. Yeah. <laughs> other, than, other than, we'll just jump right into it. Other than the one that was made four years ago. What is the it, Dad? Ba- the Ballad of Buster Scruggs. Oh, that's a good one. God, it's a good one, and it's a cut, and it's not. And by the way, this is the only one that's not a horror film that I'm bringing up. But yeah, it is. It is six tales, and you know, usually with anthology films, you probably get three or four, but this is six. Mm-hmm. Um, it's all about violence and 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 living life in the old west, and every one of those is a pure work of art, in my opinion. I, 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 you know, the my favorite one is, of course, the Tom Waits one as the gold miner. Well, of course, yeah, it is. But I do have a a certain love of the very first one with, oh my God, why don't I have his name? <laughs> Guys, help me. Which one are you talking about, Tim Blake Nelson? Yeah, Tim Blake Nelson. Thank you. Oh, okay. Yeah, Tim Blake Nelson as Buster Scruggs, where he, the gunfighter. I love that story. I, I love that it. it opened up and it caught my attention right off the bat. But yeah, I just, I never saw Westerns done in an anthology series and it was a work of art. I'm just, what do you all think? Son of a bitch. I couldn't get the damn mic back on. Yes. I loved it. I think it's a work of art. I absolutely agree. I even like it. And it kind of has a spooky one at the end with Tyne Daly. Yeah. They're in the stagecoach. It's kind of spooky and you don't oh, know. I forget. You know, it's, yeah, dull, it's a, dark. It's kind of horrific in a sense of, or at least it's very brooding and it's kind of got a thriller aspect of where it's going as they're kind of exchanging stories as they go. Yeah. It, it kind of had that creep show vibe. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I love the Ballad of Buster Scruggs. It was so fun. Is that the last Coen Brothers film we're ever going to get? 
Uh, yeah. I mean, they're both doing their own separate thing now. <clears throat> yeah. I don't, I will not subscribe to Apple plus to see Macbeth. Unfortunately, I just can't do it. <laughs> I want to, but I want to, I just can't either. I I'll, are you done with that one? Fine. All right. Let me move on then to Jane, unless James wants to jump in. Oh, you got it. I'll, I'll, yeah, go ahead. This is so tough for me because there's so many. I there love. Are. I really are. There's, uh, I, and I forgot about another one. I just saw that. I was like, damn. But one of my favorite ones, and I know I'll get shit on, but it's a horror film and it is John Carpenter. But John Carpenter's Body Bags, that was meant to be a series for Showtime. What? I did not no. take that from you. No, 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 no. I knew I didn't do body bags because I knew you were going to. I, I just, just have my thoughts. I love about it, that Chad. One. I love it. I rewatched it. I have the um, not the Criterion, but the whatever that is, the blue <clears throat> underground or whatever release of it. Yeah. And no, the Screen Factory. Sorry. It still holds up because John Carpenter is hilarious in it. I wish he had done more of those. So here's the story and how this goes. Basically, Sandy King's his wife. They put this together riding around in the back of what are you smiling about, Chad? Because I, I, I am not having I, I, I still enjoy body bags, but I do not have the opinion that it still holds up that you I do. Liked it. I, I liked, liked it. it. I, I know, liked it. Just... In fact, I think that's the last good thing Toby Hooper directed. Oh, yeah, I agree with that. You know, uh, but his, his, it, his, the third segment is the second best. Okay. I like the gas station one. I know it's straight up John Carpenter <laughs> ripping himself off from Halloween, but I like it. <laughs> okay, go ahead. I, I know he is. I mean, yeah. the shots are even out of Halloween. Yeah. Was, and all the cameos. Sam Raimi is a dead body. Wes Craven is the, is the drunken guy hitting on the girl. There's so many cameos throughout that damn thing. Well, anyway, here's the story. Just Peter Jason, who's an actor who we've tried to get on the show. We almost had him booked till Jay's pissed him off. Anyway, it's a long story. Survey. 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 Had Orson Welles' Cadillac. Orson gave him a Cadillac. He kept it for years, and they were riding around the back trying to figure out who they're going to cast in this movie. I love the idea of the three of them riding around L.A. And that's how they cast it. So they casted people they knew. And they did it for Showtime. It was going to be a series. The problem is, is John Carpenter had no desire to move to Canada to shoot, shoot it on a lower budget. And it fell through after the, they did the first three anthology of the movie. I just find that yeah. fascinating. Yeah, I do too. I just... I, that so was Joe, all that killed it. That was all that killed it. It was like, we're yeah. going to shoot the pilot here. And then we're going to move to Canada so we can do it cheaper and you can do the wraparound. I'm not going to Canada to do that. I don't want to leave my house. He didn't want to miss any Lakers games. <laughs> so we did a Jack Nicholson, but he didn't have the pool that Jack Nicholson had. Well, he had the pool. His ass stayed at the house. <laughs> <laughs> Series didn't go on. But I do, I do love his little intros, and I enjoy that movie so much. I know it's not Shakespeare. I know. It's just I, I love that movie as a kid. I did. And, John, and by the way, John Carpenter – as the as the more as the mortician, the mortician who does the wrap it, around is is great however and because joe joe shit on to and he he i agree with him that he had the right to shit on goonies i do not agree with him on the right that he had to shit on the willow <laughs> it says I didn't like it willow was a kid and he says it doesn't and, well okay but joe uh, doesn't like most things i hadn't i do not have an attachment as willow as a kid either so I just had a problem. Your hatred of Val Kilmer knows no limits. I just, I feel like body bags lost something as an, as a 40 year old adult. I just oh, had a yeah. hard, I had a hard time with a uh, hair was a big one. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't comedy. Yeah. I, I laughed at it. I did have David didn't. Warner and Stacey Keach. Yeah. And then um, the first one I love the first one, the gas station, even though it's like I said, it's a mile away, you know, it's going to happen. And then the eye, where you see, and by the way, if you want to see Mark Hamill's ass, watch yeah. Body Bags. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Him and Twiggy. Yeah. And it Twiggy, Twiggy plays his wife. Yeah, is it, is it, oh yeah, that's right, because Sheena Easton is the person in hair. Yeah. That's right, yeah. I got I got him confused. I, uh, yeah, no, no. And actually, I'd really do, uh, there's some shots in that. I like the eye one. You're right. You see it coming from a mile. <laughs> you see the yeah. eye coming from, <laughs> a, coming mile from a mile away. Yeah, but you no. do. I'm not going to shit on body bags because I do love it. I just don't think it's held up as much as Joe likes oh, to say it does. <laughs> I even like the music. Him and Jim Lang. That's good stuff. 
That's good stuff. All right, James, James. James, which one do you want to talk about, man? I'm going to talk about one that's not horror. And I'll, I'm going to talk about one that, quite frankly, I watched because we were going to do this show. Uh, because I was trying to think about anthologies, and I realized, uh, so I was doing some search, and I read this summary, and I saw the cast, and I was like, yep, yeah, I'm watching it. It's on, it's on Amazon Prime. You can watch it if you've got Amazon Prime for free. Um, it is probably the best movie we're ever going to see that has Matt Furrer, <laughs> Ned Bellamy, Elizabeth Shue, Christopher Lloyd, Steve Buscemi, Linda Hunt, S- Steve Buscemi, and Christopher Lloyd playing ro- uh, playing robbers together is just it's. Are it's you going to say the scene. movie? Yeah, because I still yeah. Y'all know the movie yet? Say it. It's twenty bucks. I Never don't think for me to for me to tell it. you the title it'll be twenty bucks. Come on, fork it over. Twenty bucks. I've never seen it. Twenty Neither bucks. It was directed by Kevin Kevin Rosenfeld, Field Rosenfield. Sorry, and it basically follows twenty dollars around as it gets passed from person to person. It starts. There's an armored truck that's supposed to be loading an ATM. Twenty dollars flies loose, and a homeless woman played by Linda Hunt picks it up. And she's convinced that the lottery, the numbers on the on the serial number on the dollar bill will be the winning lottery ticket. She tries to buy a lottery ticket. It's an ongoing background thing. And later on, it ends up like a kid is trying to get somebody to buy. Uh, so it ends up with a stripper. It ends up with a kid that's trying to give it to people outside a convenience store to buy liquor for them, which is how it ends up being. Uh, causing a fight between uh, uh, Frank, who's played by Steve Buscemi, and Jimmy, who's played by Christopher Lloyd. Uh, he hands, he picks one of them and says, hey, if you'll buy me liquor, $20, you can keep what's left over. And later on, after they rob the store, they're dividing up the money, and one of them sees the, 20, um, the $20 bill and says, wait a second, how do you have $20? We're dividing it evenly. Why do you have $20? Oh, you go, I got it from the kid. And he, go, and he goes, no, you're holding out on me. And he ends up shooting it. But it's played so well. It's A lot of people haven't seen this movie, but it literally got rave reviews. Matter of fact, um, Roger Ebert said, the very lightness of the premise gives the film a kind of freedom. We glimpse revealing moments in lives instead of following them to one of those manufactured movie conclusions that pretends everything has I'm been I'm sorry, said. I just read Chad's question. And I know, I tried to ignore his question. Uh, anyway. <laughs> you um, can't say it to our viewers because you will get offended. Uh, but um, it really is. A, it, Hollywood Reporter gave it positive views. My Janet you Mesley. say, Chad. Um, <laughs> but it is, it's a movie not a lot of people have seen, but if you haven't seen it, literally... Uh, Linda Hunt, Brendan Fraser, Brendan Fraser, uh, Gladys Knight, Elizabeth Shue, Steve Buscemi, Christopher Lloyd, William H Macy, David Schwimmer, Spalding Gray, uh, Matt Furrer, Ned Bellamy, Alan North. Just it's, uh, there's more. I'm gonna stop. I'm, I'm going to watch it because I've never heard of it, and you you have enticed me. As long as it's not as as cheesy as that violin movie with samuel l jackson that was going to be one of my other one you absolute jerk face i'm sorry i did to you what joe's done to me so i will move on to my second pick and talk about tales from the dark side <laughs> but i love tales from the dark side i, I like do it so t- much better than the series actually i do too oh, I now design- the series has that great episode where that guy steals the thing from the egyptian runes and then uh cole meany comes along at the end and he's ate by bugs not well, funny Meany, enough guys so does the movie has something about the egyptians as well but go yes with, it with was an entire food. trend people walking like them and everything yeah no uh and by the way we'll talk about this in our part two where we turn to talk about anthology tv shows but tales from the dark side tv show worst opening i've ever seen in a tv show period Probably moving on i need to go back and see it's terrible it's it's so cheesy 80s open it, it's god awful um, but Tales from the Dark Side, the movie, uh, it's one of those movies that I stumbled upon at the at the at the VHS store and I took it home and I loved it from the beginning where Deborah Harry is has a kid in a cage and she's obviously trying to cook him. 
Yep. And the only thing that's keeping this boy alive is he starts to tell stories to this witch, which we're assuming, I'm assuming she's a witch. Which is the premise of Night Books, which is also on Netflix, which I reviewed for Scarefish, which you should check out. Sorry. Night I never, is, but I mean Netflix. that entire that's that's all based on uh, a thousand and one tales, right? Uh, uh, Shack die. No, it's I based on. Wanted, I just wanted to throw it out there. Night it's, books. It's all based on Hansel and Gretel, witch hunters. Everybody. Yeah, knows. yeah. Where they got diabetes because he had all yeah. the sugars. James, you're a dumbass. I can't believe you he's, just said that. Jeremy got Ritter got the sugars. Ritter, you started Ritter? off so well at the start of the episode with Poe. Which, by the way, I didn't make the dead. Died in a gutter. Joke. Uh, that's, that's, that's mighty, mighty nice of you. <laughs> anyway, back to Tales no, from the Dark Side. No, Tales from the Dark Side, it man. Buster I, Poindexter. Buster. <laughs> and a cat. Oh my God, the cat uh, scenes in that in that in the Buster Poindexter film freaked me the hell out. Oh, what's his name, David? Um, he's the lead singer for the Dolls. Oh shoot, David, I can never remember his name. Somebody's screaming right now at me. And with William Hickey, the great late William Hickey. Yeah. No, and and, and Joe's mentioned it. I do really uh we the the, the Christian Slater, mm-hmm. um, Jeffrey Combs mummy. Honestly, it's probably my least favorite, but it has Jeffrey Combs in it. So it it's it's worth a watch. Oh, but you know, it also has Steve Buscemi. Yeah, I know. He's the bad guy. Oh, wait, no, it's not Jeffrey Combs. Is it Steve Buscemi? I Steve thought Buscemi. Combs. I don't know where you're getting the Jeffrey Combs, but he's in no another idea. one I can recommend. God, Lovecraft by Brian Usna, where he plays Lovecraft. You've got to, you all have got to correct me on these. I keep messing up because I don't have my notes in front of me. Well, for in a my, split second, I thought I was wrong. No, and, and I, I do want to talk. Traveled. I want to talk about my favorite one, and it's the James Reamer and uh, Ray Don Chong. That's your favorite. That's my favorite. Why? And I, I just love the, the fact when I was a kid, I loved it. The fact that there is this man who finds this monster and he vows never to say her name and then he falls in love. He has the perfect life and yet he, he is compelled to tell the story and it just unravels his entire yeah. life. And they all end up as gargoyles. And they all end up as gargoyles. And it's a dev- and it's, it's clearly devastates her as the gargoyle. Yeah. It, it was a great, I loved it. I thought it was. No, even I like as a kid, it. I was just curious why that why was your favorite. Yeah, even as a kid, even as a kid, it pulled at my heartstrings. And I was, you know, I wanted to go see Jean-Claude Van Damme. I'm like, this is a tragic story. Um, but no, I, I really love Tales from the Dark Side, the movie. If you haven't seen it, please check it out. Joe. Yeah, so mine's a little more obscure. Um, it's from 1989. No one remembers it. I saw it as a kid. I actually haven't seen it since I was a kid, so I really shouldn't list this as one of my favorites. But it's one of those that nobody talks about, and it's directed by Woody Allen, Francis Ford Coppola, and Martin Scorsese. It's New York Stories. Yeah. You guys ever seen it? A long time ago, but so I'm I'm like you. I cannot attest to what? anything about it. <laughs> New York Story. Now that was why. Um... Is that why they did L.A. Story with Steve Martin? Was that the answer to that one? No. Or was that I, Manhattan? I don't, that, that, no, I don't think so. I think L.A. LA Story, Story was an answer to a movie set in Manhattan. <laughs> it may be. I don't know. But New York Stories has three different sparks. So basically the Woody Allen one is he's got an overbearing mom and she's, and I'm not going to look, I'm going to go by memory. Yeah, and then she turns into a giant woman that might bite you in the ass with the whole with me and Jeffrey Combs. No, I think I've got it. The one I yeah. like the most, the one I remember, is also got. This is so funny, guys. Steve Buscemi in a small role as the artist. Three in a row. I know, and no, he's Nick Nolte. He's an artist, and he's seeing a younger woman, and she's and they're just and that one's directed by Martin Scorsese. That's the one I remember, and the other one's about a little girl in an apartment. And that's Francis Ford Coppola. That's the one I remember the least. Had the least impact on me. But New York Stories. I mean, where else would you have gotten all three of? Hold on now. Where else would we have gotten Woody Allen, Francis Ford Coppola, and Martin Scorsese all to direct a movie? and anthology and i just looked it up it had a budget of 15 million do you know how much it made at the box office no idea guess less than 15 <laughs> it's made Oof. 10 i didn't think it'd even make 10 came out march the 5th 1989 i bet leviathan killed it we probably we had to have talked about it in our 1989 one 
James, go. L.A. Story. Directed by Mick Jackson, written by Steve Martin. Steve Martin. Was indeed pitched as a response to New York stories. But L.A. Story doesn't isn't an anthology. No. But I'm telling you, if you look at the trivia and the background information on making um, uh, of the making of L.A. Story, it was I, I thought I was right. And I absolutely was. Um, Have you guys seen L.A. Story? The movie ends with him talking to a billboard on the side of the freeway. Yeah, it's got a ton of cameos it. though, and it? Right? Rick Moranis yeah. plays a grave dick. I think he talked. I thought he talked through the billboard throughout the whole movie. He does. I couldn't. Movie, I just remember him going back and forth with the billboard as he finally finds the girl and falls in love. Yeah. You get you get Rick Moranis, Woody Harrelson, Martin Lawrence, Chevy Chase, Paul Abdul, and Terry Jones. All Woody Harrelson is his boss at the news station. He's a weather reporter. Plus, you get Patrick Stewart and Scott Bakula. So those are your two Star Trek captains that every film should have. Like every film should be required to feature two Star Trek captains. There's enough of them. I mean, honestly, I'm not even going to argue with him, Jed. I mean, mm-hmm. I mean, come on. Some of them, I don't understand why we don't use uh, uh, Hawk. <laughs> I forgot his name. Avery, Avery Brooks. I don't know why Avery we don't Brooks. use Avery Brooks more. I don't know why Avery Brooks is not more. And that's I don't know why he's not acting or he's a fantastic actor. Yeah, he's uh, Avery Brooks. Oh, yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't know. Unless he's retired by choice. I don't know. I, I, but, I imagine that's part of it is he doesn't have to. So He was so good in the big hit. I was actually sitting here thinking, what's the name of that movie with Mark? Wal- the one movie with Mark Wahlberg that I think he's entertaining. All right, who's next? James, James. It's me. And oddly enough, I guess I'm going to keep a, a trend going because this is the a film one? I vaguely, vaguely remember seeing. At somebody showed it to me and said, "Oh, you'll like this because you like movies about movies," which is an odd thing to say. Um, that oh, being said. That being said, it was also Peter Dinklage's film debut and stars. And James had a stroke. <laughs> no, uh, Steve Buscemi, Dermot Moroney, <laughs> Catherine Keener, Peter Dinklage. I'm talking about Living in Oblivion. I've never now, seen I haven't it. seen it in a long time. And this now, preparing for this made me go, what was that movie? And I looked it up. I didn't re- remember Peter Dinklage. I remember the character, but I didn't connect it with Peter Dinklage. Uh, it is three stories where largely the same actors repeat, but the basic plot to it is Steve Buscemi plays a low-budget movie director trying to direct a film, and it's three different parts. The first one, spoiler, is a dream, but it's basically... Um, there's spoiled milk on set and none of the takes will work right. Every time he thinks he's got a good one, the boom mic will drop into the shot or, and there's all this stuff going on. He wakes up at the end and realizes that was just a dream, but then it, excuse me, it continues to go on. You get three different stories about the challenges of making a low budget film. Uh, Peter Dinklage's character is tired of being typecast as a dwarf. You have all these different parts of of what it's it, it's done in a, in a somewhat humorous way, but it really <clears throat> does a relatively decent job about showing how hard it is to get all these stars to align, everything to work out. It's just it's an interesting little movie. It was a big hit with critics. It cost five hundred thousand to make and made one point one million dollars. Uh, so not a huge hit, but. It was nominated as one of the 100 Years, 100 Laugh films. Uh, it did get a 2003 release on uh, home video through Sony. It's since been re-released as a two-disc set from Shout, which now I really want to get. Uh, but it is done more or less as a comedy. Um, and and it's, it's very much of its time, though. At one point, somebody says, I, I hired you because I thought you were Quentin Tarantino. Um, I mean, all this self-aware stuff, but again, it, it was a big critical acclaim, Living in Oblivion, though, and, and I never realized how many anthology films Steve Buscemi has done now. <laughs> yeah, so, um, who would have known, man? Yeah, I don't... Um, I'm going to break the cycle. Nope, Steve, no, Steve, you can't Steve, anymore. Steve you Buscemi, can't do it. he was not in this one. Joe, Joe he will be in this theater, buddy. Joe, Joe alluded to it earlier. Again, it's one of my favorite films as a kid. 
cat's eyes. I oh, love this cat's one. eye. You huh? kids with your scare with your scarum pictures. No, well, that's not true. He did a western. And I did a Martin Scorsese But picture. you even yeah. said that Western had some scary parts in it. <laughs> well, yeah, Harem Scarab had some scary parts. Harem Scarab. Terrifying. Have you heard stories about the West? It was a scary place to be. Me. You ever you know how many people got rickets? Anyway, Chad. No, I love I loved Cat's Eyes as a kid. I still do. I've I watched it a few, not a few years ago. It's probably a decade ago at this point, but I was old enough to remember and say, you know, this still holds up. It really does. It, it Go ahead. I agree. People shit on it, but I don't know why. It, it they're all taken on a night shift. The first two stories, uh, what Quitters Inc. about Quitters to- Inc. Yeah, and the the ledge, the ledge, which is my personal favorite. Was that the one with James Woods? Which or no, no, James no Woods he's was quitting. The other one is the guy from yeah. the airplane. Yeah, uh, Superman, Robert Hayes. Robert Hayes. And so, and yes, Robert Hayes was Superman. <laughs> Animated. Sorry. All right. Um, no, uh, I, it's a story about a cat who, ke- who, who keeps jumping into these crazy stories. Mm-hmm. Um, he's involved in them somehow. And just, just so our listeners know, uh, Chad hasn't suddenly became one of those, uh, beatniks that, that frequents, uh, jazz clubs. He means an actual cat, not a hep cat, just a regular one. I love the band hep cat though. Mm. Don't, don't treat me like a jerk, but anyway. Um, How are we is, supposed to treat you? Yeah. Well, like, I, I don't treat him at all. Like scum. Now come over here and put out that cigarette on my neck. <laughs> no. Call me <laughs> scum and spit on me. <laughs> See, I took it up a notch. No, it's all directed by Lewis Teague, who will not do our show. Um, director of Cujo and Romancing the Stone. Well, it's also, it was also made North Carolina for Dino D. Laurentiis, just like Cujo and all the other ones that were made yeah. in Overdrive. Oh man, Lewis Teague. Anyway, uh, but yeah, no. Uh, it, so it just follows this cat, and I, I'm the only one I don't recall. I don't remember anything about that one other than the, the cat. I remember the cat, but I don't remember Quitters Inc. The first story that it tells in the movie. Well, I, can't I remember recall the short that one story all. almost as well as James Woods, and basically it follows a short story. Of course, Stephen King actually wrote the screenplay for this movie too, right? Yeah, I remember. Yeah, and I remember Alan King was the doctor that james wood had to see yeah so they're trying to get you paid to quit smoking and if you don't do it then they will hurt you and hurt your family and so the thing is is uh once it gets to the end of the story they're talking about i'm going to give you put on some pounds right so everybody's so happy that they've quit smoking and got it out of them their family's so much better and it goes a little more in depth <laughs> in the short story. He's actually got a special needs son who lives in an institution. That, mm. Yeah, that's even, that doesn't need to be in the movie. And I think the short movie, I think the short in the movie ends the same way. It's like, I want to give you some, for basically for weight loss, because, you know, you start putting on some pounds. Oh, what if I don't? I'm going to cut off one of your wife's fingers. And then later you meet his wife, the guy over it, and she's missing like two or three fingers. Two fingers. Yeah. <laughs> yep. I'm, I'm, you're, I'm, I'm glad you're I saying think that. That's, I think the short story and the movie both end that way. Yeah, that does. Okay. Yeah, you're right. And that, but uh, the ledge, as I mentioned, is my favorite one. It's all about this Robert Hayes. He's having an affair with um, a Gangster mobster's wife. Yeah. gangster's wife, and the gangster forces him to get out on a ledge and go all the way across the building. And if he survives, he lives. If not, duh. Yep. <laughs> and it's all, and it's, it's hard pound. It's, it's very intense as he's walking through and I believe birds and then part of, and I mean, mm-hmm. it's, it's really, and Robert Hayes does a really good job in that part of the movie. And I just loved every minute of the legend. It's still one of those, those, those scenes that holds out in my brain as a child that I loved. Um, and then the third one um, is, is all about the troll. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's funny because the cat, I mean, it's it, it, the cat's not it, really important in either one of the first two stories. No, but they have to wrap it around, and it makes very little sense. The cat, the little girl's calling because she has a troll who's trying to steal her breath. Yeah, who's living in her room, and the cat <laughs> has to come save it. And that's interesting because people used to say that cats could steal kids' breath and kill them. Yeah, or whatever. Which it was, it, it involved the cats, you know, getting too comfortable and then sitting on the kid's face. Right, <laughs> not right. Sucking. Yeah, if it fits, I sit. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> sits right on his baby. 
So Dude, I I love that troll. I did. I love the troll. Even though that even as a even as a seven eight year old kid, I knew that 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 was like that last one makes no sense. Why does it? Why is it there? It just they just tacked it on. Yeah, that's Drew and then Barrymore, the right. Yes, yeah, Barrymore. Drew Barrymore, and then the troll dies in the most stupidest way imaginable. <laughs> I don't remember how the troll dies. He falls into a van. <laughs> A rotating fan and gets chopped up in itty bitty pieces made me i'm not joking guys that one scene made me scared to be around a fan because i thought it would cut off my finger <laughs> i mean it might have you tried i don't know i mean and back then they were like sharp metal yeah sharp metal yeah. fans can't buy them yeah. like that anymore you no, don't have session with box fans i know <laughs> well, uh, you to- can't I used to now back in my day, Chad. I used to have one of them sharp metal fans and just show how tough I was. I'd take lawn darts and throw at it. That's what type of guy I am. What? <laughs> All those things are banned now. All Chad. right, yeah, I got it. I, Is I was it gonna, yeah, it's you save us from that joke. <laughs> well, I'm going to do one we've talked about. Well, I can't um, save you from the joke that's your life. <laughs> I, you know, creep show is probably my favorite but i'll tell you another halloween treat and that we've talked about it on here before but damn yeah. 2007's trick or treat treat yep yeah I, I figured body bags and trick or treat were going to be on your list well i just actually i was going back and forth i almost pulled out 74's tales from the crypt but i decided to go with this one uh, and yeah. by the way i like 74's tales from the crypt if you ever get a chance. And, and it's all because joe hates joan collins it, she's in that right <laughs> maybe i don't know are you in a trilogy maybe. of terror no, i don't know no, Chris, no. which is another one i could have talked about but and if you've ever heard of the zuni doll that comes from that and karen black keep keep talking i'm gonna look it up so i don't I anyway trick or treat it takes place in halloween night <coughs> joan collins idea. boom drops mic why did joan collins drop the mic <laughs> she's got the shakes oh, <laughs> oh. Too soon. Anyway, yeah. love the movie. It really it suffered because Superman Returns was a bomb, right? Mm, yeah, Isn't that the story. That's the reason it never got theatrically released. It's written directed by Michael Doherty, and Michael Doherty was one of the writers on Superman Returns, and it was one of those package deals, and it didn't do. In that, am I wrong about that? I, I don't know the story about that. I think that it's be, a short version. But, but you but are right. He wrote. He he was one of Brian Singer's partners. So it's the same reason why I was like, I has Army of Darkness in February with nothing because it got caught up in who was going to get the sequel rights mm-hmm. to Silence of the Lambs. Yeah. I know that makes no sense to anybody probably listening, but Hollywood's a business and this is how this shit goes down. So the reason you didn't discover Trick or Treat till later in video and why it wasn't out in theaters and a big hit, <clears throat> long story, but it takes place on Halloween night, several vignettes, they all... A, they now that's a movie where unlike cat's eye it actually makes sense and all comes together yes all comes together it is beautifully told yeah and shot everything about it yeah yeah and there's a couple if you've never seen it there's a couple of like holy shit can't i mean shocked i mean as far as storytelling oh i didn't see that coming yeah yeah so i trick-or-treat i'm not gonna spend a long time on it but I, since I didn't want to talk about Creep Show because everyone knows Creep Show, Trip I'm trying Trip. to look up the I'm trying to look up the actor Dylan Baker as oh the, the bad guy yeah. as the bad guy and him out there with his son, man, it everything with Dylan Baker and it is just creepy and scary and he's great in that in that movie. I love I love Dylan Baker so yeah it Dylan Baker honestly made that film for me. Yep. All right. James, you're live. I'm going to talk about one that Chad already crapped over because he has he uh, has no taste. God, it's he such has a no boy. taste. If it's not filled with crap jokes, he doesn't care. Yeah, um, I know. But notice I didn't talk about 43. I wanted to. I, I talked about it too because there's a couple of 40. There's a couple of segments in 43 I, that I think are hilarious. Gentlemen, oh. I saw it in theaters with my wife. <laughs> I I'm sorry. The period joke one is hilarious. It's directed still, by a woman, and it's funny as hell. If that if they would have started the movie with that one versus Hugh Jackman has balls on his chin, which isn't funny. It's not funny. That movie would have been a success. But they started it wrong. They went for star power versus funny, it's and that was their mistake. Instead of menstruation. Yeah. Um. It is hilarious. It's directed by Elizabeth Banks, right? Yeah. 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 No, it's hilarious. Um, 
Talk so, about your violin movie. <laughs> yeah, the red violin, which I'm sure 99.9% of people have not seen, tells the story of a violin. It was either that or Tales from the Hood, bud. And it, it follows <laughs> from 1681 when the violin's made, and when the violin's made, its, its future is foretold by tarot cards up to 1997. And you follow the story of how it gets made, what it looks like, what does it mean? And um, they, the, the why is the violin red is one of the stories. It's a very tragic story. You jump forward to, and that's predicted. Uh, you get the hanged man card and it goes into uh, a the story of a, one of the early owners who's a violin prodigy that, but it's, it's it's a cursed object by this point, at least allegedly. That's 1793. It then jumps forward a uh, hundred years to Oxford, where the the violin keeps getting passed down. And you follow the violin, you end up in China. So it travels around the world. It's a global story, just following this rare violin that's rare because it's red has all this mythology is it cursed is it bad the famous person you're born you just tell me stuff. about it oh please tell me about your cat movie again oh a troll fights a cat that sounds fascinating technically that was chad's yeah that was chad's i don't, don't listen to us what, what, what do you grow a beard so i can tell you apart anyway the point oh, being shit, he's been <laughs> working on it forever i uh, know no, he's a fuck stick <laughs> Oh my Sorry. God! Don't Will Smith me. Don't Will um, <laughs> it all comes back, folks. Full oh, circle. Anyway, uh, fuck Will Smith. The the final card is death, and but it's inverted, and which means rebirth. And you find out what's going to happen to it. The movie is has an international cast. It was made by three different countries working together to make this movie. It is a beautiful, sad, somehow still life affirming film at times. Uh, and, and nobody nobody that watches this show is going to go, oh, I'm going to pick his because we just have people that like horror films watch this. What am I even talking about the Red Violin? You should see the Red Violin, though. Samuel L. Jackson um, gets uh, bit in half at the very end by a shark. Now, you're going to think, isn't that another movie? Yes, it is, but I'm trying to get you to at least give the movie a shot. It is slow. Yeah, It, it is purposeful. And it does it have a beautiful film. And it does not. It does have Samuel L. Jackson, but it also has Jason Fleming in it. And anything with Jason Fleming in it is also worth the watch. Jason so. Fleming and Jason Isaacs. Yeah, it it won for the best, best British origin. character actor. So some of the some of the awards it won just so to to counteract Chad's is terrible because I know everybody looks to Chad. I never movies. said it was terrible. Um, I never said it was terrible. Won no. the Academy Award for best uh, original score. It won countless genie awards for everything from editing to because they wished picture. it would go away. <laughs> uh, it won. You can wish it would go away. Have you thought about trying to murk it on your face? Um, yeah. <laughs> you can get like the landing strip one and kind of do a goatee kind of thing. I, I was just trying, but you, but no, as we talked about in the do beginning, they have a they, Fu Manchu murk. There were they did a girl like that. Oh there were God. tons of horror movies I could have went with, but I purposely tried to avoid that because I figured those guys would do it. But the Red Violin, actually, when my wife and I was dating, uh, she asked to borrow a couple of films, and one of the ones I gave her was the Red Violin, and it pretty much was, if you can enjoy this, we probably can date. And the other one was that one movie with Vincent Gallo. What's the name? It was Buffalo 66. Brown Bunny? There's three of them. But we gave her Brown Bunny and said, if you can no, do not this. Brown Bunny. Not brown buddy. You were more than capable of taking whatever I've got. <laughs> <laughs> Not brown bunny. Buffalo. You know, I'll be honest, Joe. If you've I've never seen never brown seen, bunny, you're like, what's Joe talking about? Go watch it. I've never seen all of brown bunny. Uh, oh, I couldn't stop. There's a, couple, there's a couple parts of brown bunny that I only saw edited. Uh, but now edited, that being edited. said, that uh, Vincent Gallo's an interesting cat because I like the funeral, which he didn't direct, but he's in. And it's got Christopher Walken and uh, Chris Penn. It's a good movie. It's odd, but it's good. Uh, and then, and then an Buffalo 66. Film. No, but you all spend time talking about Merkins. Why do you all get to break the fourth wall? And when I do it, it's a crime. <laughs> I think it's because we're dicks. Oh, okay. Well, that makes it. Now I'm on board. Now I understand. <laughs> Let's talk about some of our honorable mentions. I'm going first. I, I have Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Yeah. 
Actually, Monty Python, the meaning a lot. Monty Python. In I mean, why did I say the Holy Grail? I, mean, I don't know. Yeah, I, was gonna I, I meant to you, say meaning of like, life. Okay. I meant to say meaning of life. I'm sorry. There, I'm not the only one who screwed up this episode. Which well, is it's funny. The case. I've, been, I've been sitting here. That's what I was going back and forth, and I changed it at the last moment. But meaning of life. The only reason I didn't pick it. I mean, technically, that's a uh, Holy Grail is an anthology, too, if you count all the different stories. Yeah, yeah but meaning of life really is. And the only is reason definitely I didn't an anthology. pick it is because it, <laughs> even though it is com- it is their most flawed film, but it's yeah. still much better than anybody else's. And your favorite is the Grim Reaper one, I think, right? I mean, it's hard not to be. That and I, everyone else is, is like, your, is what's the fat guy's name? Terry Jones? No. Well, he <laughs> plays it. Harsh. Harsh. Yeah. Now he's dead. So thank you, Chad, for yeah, f- f- Fuck off. I'm yeah, fine. what's his name? Mr. Whatever. I don't remember. But no, and uh, by, I, I by just, the way, it's Waffet then. Waffet. The Grim Reaper, the Grim Reaper, and then the the, the Irish Catholic one is my oh, favorite. Yeah, one. every yeah. sperm is sacred. Yeah, those are my two favorites. Oh, yeah. you fucking Americans would let me tell you something. Something. <laughs> the pet day. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> oh, flawed movie, but I love it. All right. Uh, honorable you, you done? I'm with okay, you, my, bitch. my I got, honorable. I got a dozen more. Well, uh, do you want me to go then, or do you want to go? Fuck yeah. Fuck. Just go. Okay. So, uh, and Joe's alluded to this one again. I did it. He did it to me three times. I wanted to put this in my top three. Times three a lady. But I honestly couldn't remember enough to talk about it, and I couldn't find a copy to watch. Tales from the Hood. <laughs> I like Tales from the Hood. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure it's. I like sucks, Tales from the Hood too. I'm sure it does too. All I remember is Corbin Burtson as the racist, and I, all I remember is David Allen Greer doing a solid, straight performance as a. You know, David Allen Greer doesn't get enough credit for his acting range because he's oh, mostly he's an asshole in that. He does a really good job of being an asshole. Yeah, he is amazing in that film, but I don't. Re- I never. Re- I could not remember enough, other than Clarence William the Third, yep. as as the storyteller, and he was amazing. Um, so yeah, I, I just love Tales from the Hood. I just haven't seen it in years and I couldn't talk about it enough. And then uh, I'm going to give a special shout out and we talk, and it's just because we talked about it last episode, the very last uh, part of Four Rooms, nothing else. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, one other one is Black Sabbath, uh, Mario Bava. Definitely. I forgot to mention that. I didn't forget to mention it, but that a lot of filmmakers love his work and love that movie in particular. I really need to go back yeah. and watch it. And um, shit, I forgot my one. James, what are yours? Uh, a couple that came to mind. I mean, there's a ton of comedy ones. Kentucky Fried Movie. There's yeah. the Amazon Women on the Moon. I mean, that's another area. Comedies have a lot of anthologies. And I'm glad you mentioned Amazon Women on the Moon because that's one that's completely forgotten. I bought the one sheet at the Kentucky for like five bucks. I own it on DVD, I think. I and, do and too. It's... It's it's literally one of the only places you can see so many different people that did so many different things. But I just always Rip Taylor's funeral home stuff gets me every time. Like it's not laugh out loud funny, but basically the entire point to the sketch is: what if you just had stand up comedians give your funeral eulogy to try to lighten the mood? Yes. That's the point of the plot, and it's not laugh out loud funny. But there's something about Rip Taylor basically looking over at the mm-hmm. widow and saying, "Well, at least you can have sex with somebody else." Now. I mean, that's not what he says, but it's basically. And there's so many them. directors. There's John Landis, Joe Dante. I'm trying to remember the rest of them. I can't right off the top of my head. Uh, I said there was a couple other ones that I really wanted to see after we started working on this that I haven't seen. There's Out of Mind, the stories of H.P. Lovecraft, which I've never seen, but I want to see it um, based on it was a made for TV film. But uh, I have to mention the Sin City films. Yeah, they're definitely anthologies and they're really well done. Um, Man. For my son, I have to mention the Three Caballeros because, God, he used to love the Three Caballeros. And uh, and I've got one I've got to mention that I haven't seen, Chad, but I have to assume you have. And if not, gentlemen, we may have to track down a copy. Is it the Groove Tube? No, it's Tales from the Crapper. Oh, the trauma oh. film. <laughs> I saw that one, too. Because honestly, <laughs> I was just looking at the cast and Ted Raimi and James Gunn. 
How could you go? Eli Roth? Wes Craven? It's How worth can, a watch. But yeah, I saw I saw that Troma had an anthology one. I'm like, oh, Tales from the Crapper. It, it's basically, <laughs> uh, uh, oh, shoot, who's the head of uh, Lloyd Kaufman plays the crap keeper, Joe. It's, it's the crap keeper. Yeah. And I he's the it. host of this anthology. Yeah. The crap keeper. It's yeah, a little Joe. on the nose for me. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it, yeah, and, and so yeah, it's it's it's. I'm sure it's terrible. I know. But it's ninety minutes long. Real real quick, there was another one that I enjoyed, and it has uh, one of uh, James's favorite comedians who used to write for uh, The Simpsons. I can't remember his name. Dana Gould. Uh, Dana Gould. Tales from Halloween's pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. I love Dana Gould. Dana Gould also wrote it's not an anthology, but speaking of Dana Gould, he 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 created Stan versus Evil, which Evil, didn't have yeah. a huge budget, but I it was a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. Agreed. John C. McGinley, who Joe talked to until that restraining order came in. Listen, there's did very he t- did he can tell any stories about Stan versus Evil, by the way? No, but I, that I, man I could have that. talked for six hours. It was his favorite thing was to answer questions from fans. So if you ever get a chance, I I'm not just saying this one of the nicest folks better i told chad before it was like better than i hoped i mean just yeah more than nice by the way who do, who do you think uh, jumping back into anthology real quick is it just me or does jim jarmusch do more anthologies than anybody I almost a uh, coffee and cigarettes I, i'm almost which i was gonna say I do which, like you know who that stars joe steve Bush. <laughs> man he does a lot of anthologies um but no, that's what that's the one I was thinking of. But then there were a ton of other anthologies that were Jim Jeremy. I'm like, he did a ton of anthologies. Yeah, Night in the City and uh, or Night on Earth, Night on Earth. Yeah. All right, guys. Well, this has been our anthology show. I think next week you're going to get anthology TV shows. So if you have any ideas, let us know. We'll probably won't listen to any of them. We might. Tom, I've Tom got, Waits. Tom Waits does a, uh, did a couple anthologies too. Now, would you consider Seven Psychopaths an anthology? No, no. It's pretty. It's linear, but it does follow a couple different psychopaths. Seven of them, I guess. I'm glad that 55 minutes into the show, you decided to give us something. <laughs> oh, this isn't for you. This is for the fan. This is for the fan to enjoy. <laughs> this has been Bonehead Weekly. It spins around and blows air. Grrrr. <sighs>